Hi, my name is Leal Hurlitz. I am the Director of Medical Kidney Pathology here at the Cleveland Clinic. And I wanted to share with you an interesting case that came across our service in the last couple of weeks. And as with all renal pathology cases, it will begin with some clinical history. Our patient is a 74-year-old man. He has a history of diabetes and hypertension. And he presented to one of our hospitals with a shortness of breath. He was found to have acute kidney injury when he was admitted to the emergency room. And they dipped his urine, and his urine showed large blood, 300 milligrams per deciliter of protein, and urine sediment was quite active with many red cells and 10 to 25 white cells for high-powered field. A nephrology consult was requested, and they did a 24-hour urine collection, which showed 4.74 grams of proteinuria. So at this point, there was a high suspicion for some kind of glomerular disease, and so a serologic evaluation was undertaken. And that was significant for a mildly positive ANA of 1 to 80. C3, which was moderately decreased at 54, the normal range in our lab is 68 to 260. A C4 that was in the normal range at 27. Additional pertinent negatives were a negative ANCA serology, negative anti-glomerular basement membrane titers, and negative hepatitis serologies. But serum protein electrophoresis, as well as urine protein electrophoresis, did show spikes that were monoclonal at 0.33 grams per deciliter in the serum and at 0.21 grams over the 24-hour collection in the urine. So at this point, because of the spike, the low complements, the positive ANA, and the strong suspicion clinically that something was going wrong with the glomeruli, a renal biopsy was under, undertaken. And at this point, we will go to the scope to see what was found. So I've scanned some slides here. This is our standard H&E stain, low power. You can see here we have a core of medulla, and in here we have two cores of cortex. From this sort of low power, you can appreciate that there is some chronic inflammation, which we often see in areas of scarring, but there's quite a lot of viable kidney parenchyma here. As we zoom in, we can begin to recognize the glomeruli here. And we see from this power that they appear to be sort of lobulated and hypercellular. And as we zoom in further, we can appreciate that glomerular basement membranes, even with the HNE, appear markedly thickened. They have this sort of glassy, eosinophilic appearance. We can see that many of the glomerular capillaries are actually filled with infiltrating leukocytes. And the whole glomerulus looks significantly abnormal. So there's definitely a proliferative process going on here. And this glassy eosinophilic material is probably composed of deposits. So in renal pathology, our bread and butter, as opposed to H&E, which is most of pathology, is the PAS stain. So if we look at the PAS stain, here, again, we zoom in. We can identify the glomeruli. And PAS is an excellent stain for highlighting basement membrane morphology. And what we can see here in this glomerulus is that we have these capillaries. They are filled with cells. The glomerular basement membranes are markedly thickened. And they have, again, this glassy material inside them. What's interesting on the PAS stain is that most immune deposits are strongly PAS positive, but in this case, the material is quite PAS pale, which is somewhat unusual. If we switch stains yet again to the trichrome stain, which we typically use for the analysis of the degree of fibrosis, we can appreciate from low power that there's quite a bit of red, and red is basically non-fibrotic cortex, so there's quite a bit of cortex left here that appears viable. One of the other things that trichrome stain can highlight, however, is the presence of immune deposits. Immune deposits typically stain brightly fuchsinophilic, or red, with the trichrome stain. And here again, we can see that these glomerular capillaries, rather than being the blue that a normal glomerular capillary is with the trichrome stain, are significantly red. Um, we can also see that this red material is deposited throughout the mesangium. And it is associated with this proliferative activity, as well as leukocyte infiltration. If we move toward the fourth stain that we standardly do in renal pathology, we can see this is the Jones silver stain. And one of the things that Jones silver does beautifully is it illustrates duplication of glomerular basement membranes. If we look at this case here and select a glomerulus, zoom in we can see with the Jones stain 
that we have this glassy material that's pink or silver negative in between. And you can clearly see two layers of glomerular basement membrane on each side. So these are beautiful proliferative and membranoproliferative features that we can recognize by light microscopy. So in renal pathology, light microscopy is actually just the beginning. It allows us to diagnose a pattern of injury, but it doesn't tell us mechanistically what is causing that injury. So for that, we need ancillary studies, and we standardly use immunofluorescence and electron microscopy. So in this case, we applied our standard immunofluorescence panel, which consists of the heavy chains IgG, IgM, IgA, complement components C1q and C3, and light chains kappa and lambda. And while we could clearly just see that there were abundant deposits by light microscopy, I was surprised because the only positive staining in this case by our standard techniques was for C3, or complement component 3. Everything else was entirely negative. Electron microscopy was very interesting in that it showed abundant electron-dense deposits. Here we can see abundant deposits in mesangial areas. And this is a low power where we can trace the glomerular basement membrane along the capillary loops. And we see these large subendothelial electron-dense deposits accompanied by prominent leukocyte infiltration within the glomerular capillaries. If we zoom in a little bit further, here we see a portion of the glomerular tuft. There's a mesangial area here with a mesangial cell. And we can see the glomerular basement membrane outlined. We see the large, highly electron-dense subendothelial deposits. We don't see really anything in the subepithelial space other than podocytes with some foot process effacement. Uh, but we do see abundant mesangial and subendothelial deposits. If we go to even higher power here, which is about 5,000x in total, we have our glomerular basement membrane here. And then we can see our large subendothelial deposit. And these cells on top of the deposits are actually macrophages. And if you look inside the cytoplasm of the macrophages, you can actually see bits of this deposit that have been phagocytosed by these infiltrating leukocytes. So there's very active phagocytosis of these deposits. So at this stage, this is where we usually stop in renal pathology. We've done our immunofluorescence, our electron microscopy. We've correlated it with our light microscopy. And what I would say here is that light microscopy has shown a membranoproliferative pattern of injury. Immunofluorescence showed a C3 staining without significant staining for anything else. Electron microscopy confirms the presence of highly electron-dense deposits in mesangial and subendothelial areas. And if you add all these things up, the current best fit diagnosis would actually be C3 glomerulonephritis. And C3 glomerulonephritis, in terms of renal pathology, is a relatively recently defined entity, probably the past 10 or 15 years. And we now realize that mechanistically, C3 glomerulonephritis is related to dysregulation of the alternative complement pathway. So typically when you issue a diagnosis of C3 glomerulonephritis, there's a large workup um, for genetic mutations, et cetera, in the alternative complement pathway, and people begin considering using treatment with complement inhibitors and other types of immunosuppressive therapy. Now one of the interesting things I think about this case is that this C3 glomerulonephritis developed quite late in this patient's life. He's in his 70s. Um, and we were suspicious that there was perhaps a paraproteinemia um, or maybe an underlying autoimmune disease. And it's a little bit hard to tie that to C3 glomerulonephritis. There are people who believe, and I'm among them, that actually monoclonal proteins can cause dysregulation of the complement pathway and result in C3 glomerulonephritis. Uh, but in terms of guiding clinical management, if we're still suspicious that there might be a paraprotein, we need to do more here. And there's been increasing recognition in the last several years that especially in the setting of monoclonal proteins, deposits can be masked and they won't show up on our routine testing. So we do have some salvage techniques that are usually only used when we don't have enough glomeruli, but in the case of paraproteinemia, they can actually be valuable and more sensitive than our standard techniques. So in this case, what we did was we re-performed immunofluorescence, but this time on paraffin tissue. And the difference between performing it on paraffin tissue and performing it on frozen tissue, which are our standard technique, is that when you do it on paraffin tissue, you have to do an antigen retrieval step. You have to treat the tissue with a protease. And we believe that in this case, and in several other cases that we've seen, you can actually unmask deposits that are there that don't show up on your standard immunofluorescence techniques. 
So here in this panel, we can see the kappa staining, which is negative with our standard technique. But when we apply that same stain to pronase digested paraffin sections, we see bright positivity in the distribution that we saw the deposits on light microscopy and electron microscopy. In contrast, lambda, as kappa was in the original technique, is negative. But on the pronase digested paraffin sections, it is also negative. So we have an apparent kappa light chain that's been deposited in these glomeruli without an accompanying heavy chain and without an accompanying light chain. And that helps make the strong argument that what we're actually dealing with here is a dysproteinemia-related renal disease. So ultimately, the final diagnosis in this case turns out to be membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis with masked monoclonal kappa light chain deposits. And this was an important diagnosis to make because it gave our clinical colleagues in nephrology and oncology the confidence that they needed in order to treat this patient for a monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. He was then bone marrowed and found to have approximately 10% plasma cells that were kappa restricted. And he's now currently being treated as a myeloma patient with cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, bortezomib, and also plasmapheresis in an effort to help preserve his kidney function.